Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so excited to see all of you. This is a, a very important conversation that we're about to engage in, and so I really appreciate that you all took time out of your busy schedules to spend the afternoon with us. My name is Diane Littlefield. I serve as the Vice President for Programs and Partnerships here at Sierra Health Foundation over the, the last um, eight years. Um, my role this, morning, uh, this afternoon is pretty much just to get us started. I do want to let you know a couple of things. One, that this event is being recorded, will be placed on our website after the event. If you have some concerns about being on the site, just let any of staff member know and we will take care of it. Um, also, we are telecasting this event to our Merced office and who also would be participating in the Q&A. So we will have questions coming in um, at the end of the event from, from our, Mer there's a contingent in Merced also listening. So hello, Merced folks. Um, also too, we're delighted to let you know that Mr. Steve Phillips' book, Brown is the New White, will be distributed following the event. And I just checked with him and he said he's got his pen ready um, in case you would like to do some autographs. So thank you for your being gracious to do that. I also want to acknowledge um, two board members here today, um, Mr. Her Jose Hermosillo, who will be playing a key role this afternoon, and also, also um, Dr. Trey Washburn right here at the front of the room. And we um, really very much appreciate their support and leadership on, um, for today's event. We also have an elected official, uh, Yolo County Superintendent of Schools, Jesse Ortiz in the back, his wonderful wife. So thank you so much for attending. And if there are any electeds who came in after I came to the podium, please, we would love to acknowledge you. Let me know. So we also want to let you know that we are participating in social media. And so for those of you, I will not be saying put away your phones. Um, I will be asking you to take out your phones or iPads or electronic devices so you can participate in social media. And please note our hashtag SHF speaker series. And we hope you'll be very, very active. My, um, my last role here um, this afternoon is to introduce um, our president and CEO, Chet Hewitt, and it's always my honor to do so. And Chet, as many of you know, has been with the foundation about nine years now. And we've undergone, I, would, I can easily say since I've been here for eight of those years, we've undergone a, an incredible transformation that we're very proud of. I think if I could list three things, one is I think a deeper connection with communities, especially communities exp experiencing disproportionately um, poor health, poor um, socioeconomic conditions, and, and just our building um, stronger relationships um, through our staff, through our partners, um, with the community, so their, their voice is, is um, as central to this work. I would say second, a deeper focus on health and racial equity. And many of you who work with us, that is also your mission. And so we're really proud to work together with you in those, in those efforts. Um, I'd say the last um, is that we do almost all of our work in partnership. And I would say um, really always proud to have a leadership who really um, models uh, humbleness about the important work that we, we undertake. So I promised him I would keep it short. So Chet, I'm actually going to stop there, even though I have a lot of stuff highlighted. And um, I just want to welcome all of you. So glad you're here today. And uh, we look forward to this afternoon. So please join me in welcoming Chet to the podium. Thank you very much, Diane. I want to say uh, welcome to all of you here, and welcome to our colleagues who are in uh, the office in Merced. And this, Diane said they'll be participating uh, in this particular uh, series today um, as well. I have really two charges. Uh, one is to uh, welcome you all here, which I am in the process of doing, and then introduce uh, the first two uh, speakers, who will be Jose Hermosillo, who board member who will be moderating the panel, and then Steve Phillips, who is the author of the book. And it's very uh, clear to me that that is the reason why we're all gathered here, so my remarks will be brief. I'll start by just trying to answer a single question, and that was one that's been posed to me by a number of folks who have said, why is a health foundation interested in this conversation? Right. What does this have to do with health? Why do you believe this is an important conversation? Well, if you know anything about the, the Sierra Health Foundation, one of the ways that we've really worked hard to distinguish ourselves is to be about more than access to clinical care. 
Some of you who have been in this room with me before have heard me talk about the importance of clinical care when people are ill. But you've also heard me talk a lot about the importance of producing wellness at the very same time. Making sure that folks had access to food and vegetables and had access to environments where people were safe, where kids could be active. Those conditions, the social determinants of health, and our ability to actually promote them is largely determined by the policy framework in which we operate. That policy framework is a derivative of our political realities. It drives our ability to invest in things that we as a community, that we as a society, deem to be important. They say that at its very essence, policy is a value system. And so the emergence of a new policy framework that we hope will give new opportunities and provide for new investments in the things that we know are, or have the ability to produce better health in communities that suffer disproportionately poor health outcomes is why this conversation is important. I also say that one of our uh, largest and newest efforts is our work around the San Joaquin uh, Valley. If you know a couple of the San Joaquin Valley, it's described as the Appalachia of the West, and some of the poorest health outcomes in this country, some of the poorest air quality, over 65 communities that don't have water. So when we think about the production of health, we think about this conversation around who gets to set the policy agenda. That's a derivative of that kind of political environment. You can see the connection between those activities, the setting of that framework, the opportunities that come out of it, and the ability of an institution that's committed its 30 years to the promotion of health as being connected. So that's how we get to this particular conversation. Now, in our speaker series, we have tried to be thoughtfully provocative. And that is not to simply shape your opinion, but allow you to hear new and different voices that give you an opportunity to have a better informed opinion of your own. So I want to, I hope that you will really engage in a conversation. There'll be opportunity uh, for questions uh, to any of the panelists as we actually go forward this afternoon as well. And then as you leave this room, you know, share with friends and colleagues some of the things you may have heard or your own ideas that come out of it in ways that uh, I think inform the kind of public discourse about what is possible in California, given the enormous demographic shifts that are happening. In many ways, I could summarize our interest as not being tied specifically to the political process itself. We're a foundation. We don't dabble in that particular arena, right? We all have our own personal opinions of that, but that's not what's on display here. What we're really interested, at, interested in at Sierra Health is that potential for that new framework to be realized. It is the outcome from those changes that we're interested in. And in that outcome, or as we reach that, are there new opportunities to talk about health in new ways, new opportunities to uh, kind of support new interventions that we think will make the more equitable distribution of good health outcomes a reality in California. That's the big charge for today. And with that, let me introduce uh, our featured guest here today. Our featured guest is Steve Phillips, who is the best-selling author of Brown is the New White. He is the founder of Power PAC, which is a political action committee. Steve is a national political leader, civil rights leader, and senior fellow at the Center for American Progress. He's been active in political and social change for 30 years. Uh, in 1992, he became the youngest person ever elected to public office, and that was in San Francisco to the school board. I know that that's true because I voted for him myself. <laughs> he went on to serve as president of the Board of Education. We authored path-breaking legislation making San Francisco the first school district in the country to incorporate books written by writers of color into the required reading curriculum in, uh, in the school system. He's the co-founder of Power Pack, a social justice and advocacy organization that conducted the largest independent voter mobilization effort backing a progressive candidates. In 2014, he co-authored the first ever audit of Democratic Party spending and was named one of America's top 50 influencers by Campaigns and Elections magazine. Steve, we're really happy to have you here today. 
Steve will be interviewed by Jose Hermosillo, who is a member of the uh, Sierra Health Foundation Board. He's also the Executive Director and Managing Director of the Sacramento Office of APCO Worldwide. Jose uh, specializes in policy and crisis communication, so we may need some of that expertise here today, Jose. Uh, with more than three decades of experience, he's been the center of dozens of high-profile legislative, regulatory, and ballot measure campaigns related to public finance, collective bargaining, workers' compensation, civil justice, consumer privacy, and the environment. He's advised corporations, public institutions, and industry groups in the manufacturing, energy, and healthcare sectors. Prior to joining APCO in 1996, Mr. Hermosillo was a principal in a political consulting firm for nearly a decade. Happy to bring uh, to the dais Steve Phillips and Jose Hermosillo. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Very good. Thank you. <clears throat> How's everybody doing? Yeah. Pretty good group. I'm going to guarantee you one thing. This will be entertaining. <laughs> we, uh, we had lunch together uh, before coming over here, and this is going to be a lot of fun. So thank you for being here. So I'm going to start with a softball question for our friend Mr. Phillips. Since this is about your book, we're going to talk about your background in a second, but I thought we could start by just having you tell, tell everybody about your book. You know, what, what exactly is your thesis and why did you write it? Um, thanks for the softball start, right? Um, and, and thanks to all of you for coming out and for being part of, uh, part of this. Um, and to Chad and to Laura to, for having me up here. And, um, you know, the, one of the best things about the book and the book tour is the chance to kind of reconnect with old friends. and. Um, you know, so we were in the trenches back uh, 25, 30 years ago um, doing this work. Um, and I think that is actually a good pivot to why I wrote the book, is that, you know, I'm, I am, I used to say I'm literally a child of the civil rights movement and that my political baptism was in the Rainbow Coalition days. Mm. And so I've always been drawn to the social justice movement, the multiracial social justice movement for change. And particularly seeing that manifested in the world of social ch of uh, electoral politics in terms of how that played itself out. So the Rainbow Coalition really was political baptism for me, where you had an individual running for president who was directly connected to the civil rights movement and to Dr. King and that work, and then was trying to translate that energy into the space of the um, electoral sphere. And I actually opened the book. The first paragraph is, um, is set in 1968, April 4th, uh, Jesse Jackson and Andy Young are waiting for Dr. King to come out. He comes out, the Lorraine Motel is shot and is killed. Forty years later, Jesse Jackson is in Grant Park, Chicago, with tears streaming down his face, watching an African American come uh, walk onto the step as pres uh, onto the stage as president-elect. And so that shows two things. Now I wanted to frame it that way for uh, uh, two reasons: is that one is to show how much the country has changed in that time period. So the, the, the preeminent leader of black America murdered in 68, and then the, the majority of the voters in the country electing an African American as president 40 years later. And that's tied into, and that is a result of the gains and the victories of the civil rights movement. In that the uh, people, many people have seen the movie Selma, talks about the Voting Rights Act struggle, um, and how the and Reverend Jackson talked about the Voting Rights Act was written in blood before it was signed in ink. And so that brought down the whites only signs on the voting booths. And so we were able to actually have the Voting Rights Act diversify who could participate, and millions of more African Americans could vote. What's less appreciated is that it also took down the whites only signs around entry into the country in terms of changing the immigration laws. The day after LBJ's speech, he did the, um, uh, he called, where he introduced the Voting Rights Act, he called together his top advisors that I want to do a whole bunch of things. And one of them was the Immigration and Nationality Act, which finally ended what had been the US policy that to be a US citizen, you had to be a free white person. And so since that time, the US population has gone from 12% people of color to 38% people of color. And so now there is a majority of people, if you take the people of color population, with the vast majority of, with it, of, of which tends to express its uh, views for social change in a more progressive fashion, 
as well as the also important meaningful minority of whites. And there's always been a consistent progressive majority, or a progressive uh, sector of the white population, uh, from abolition days, the civil rights movement, up to uh, immigration movement, of Black Lives Matter today. And, and electorally, you can quantify it around 40%, always have voted for the Democrat. So progressive whites and people of color are now the majority of people in the country. And so that, I wrote the book to tell that story because uh, too few people have appreciated that lesson in terms of how it has transpired. The country changed because of the, of the laws for the civil rights movement to elect an African-American president. But there are too few people in leadership of this country and the progressive movement in particular who fully appreciate that. And they still are caught in this mindset around discounting and not appreciating the size and significance of the voters of color in particular, but also the fact that there is a majority. And so there's still a tendency to chase the conservative white swing voter to be able to water down our, our, our agenda and our policies and our views to the lowest common denominator and to do things which are not effective in terms of building a majority. So it's really to tell that story, to uh, document what has transpired, or transpired in terms of Obama being able to be elected and even more importantly, re-elected with five million fewer white votes but still being able to win the election as a roadmap and a manifesto for what the social change movement in general should look like heading into this post-Obama era. There, there was a statement in your book that caught my eye, and, and it caught my eye because it's, and you've kind of articulated it, I think, to a great degree, a note of optimism here um, in terms of what could be. Um, and I'm just going to read the statement. It's very short. Um, and I wanted to ask you several questions related to it. So the statement reads as follows. The percentage of people of, of color in the American population has tripled, ushering in a new political era, scrambling the old electoral equations, and creating the conditions for a lasting new American majority. Uh, I'd like to hear you talk about a little bit more, I should say, about the demographic trends that you think suggest that America uh, has a progressive multiracial majority that can reshape our politics and our policies. That's the first question. So maybe a little more on the demographics around the country. Every state's obviously different. I'd like to also hear you talk, talk about what you think the definition is of progressive. Uh, I mean, you've talked about the kinds of events that have shaped your consciousness and influenced you to become a political activist that's progressive-minded. So just make sure that we're all you know, on the same page as you in terms of how you define uh, progressive thinking. And then what are the policy priorities of a, of a, of a progressive? Um, let me take the progressive one first, and then I'll move to that. So, uh, it, well, A, it's admittedly elusive in that, in terms of how you actually define it, and particularly even more than that, to quantify it. So what I use as the metric to be able to quantify is Obama's re-election numbers. Mm -hmm. And I use those numbers more so than his election numbers. As I was saying, he had 43% of the white vote in 08, but 39% in uh, 2012. And so I use that because he had an agenda at that point. He had had track record of it. And so he had, you know, pushing for uh, universal health care, for immigration reform, for marriage equality, for uh, uh, gender pay equality. He had put that agenda before the American public, and 65 million people voted for that. So that was kind of how I was using as a, as a best um, uh, criteria to quantify what progressives um, would look like. Um, and in terms of the demographics, it's interesting you were saying something about the, the optimistic piece. I was at a book event in Denver, and someone says, um, this is the most, most optimistic you know, books I've seen. Why are you so optimistic? And then I was like, well, at first I was, well, feel free to write that on Amazon. Um, that would be <laughs> helpful. <laughs> right. Um, but it's like, uh, uh, I actually have a large painting on my, uh, or a photograph on my wall in my office of people working in the field, sharecroppers picking cotton. And the reason I have that is because when I was at, in 1987, in Maxine Waters' office in the state capitol here with um, Jesse Jackson and Elihu Harris, mm -hmm. and Elihu says to Jesse, you must be so tired, you're flying back and forth across the country, and you're working so hard. And Jesse says, um, it beats picking cotton, right? And so I just think contextually how far we've actually come. Um, so in terms of the, of the composition of what I define the new American majority, broad strokes that 
23% of the eligible voters in the country are people of color, progressive people of color. So I used the, the Obama uh, percentages. So 81% of people of color, 39% of white. If you extrapolate that out to the entire elect uh, eligible voter population, that's 28% of all the eligible voters in the country are progressive whites, and 23% of all the eligible voters in the country are progressive uh, people of color. And the first chapter is called the New American, 51% and growing every day. Mm -hmm. With every single day between births, deaths, and legal immigration, 1,000 whites are added to the population, and 7,000 people of color are added to the population. The majority of uh, children under five are people of color. The majority of babies born every year are people of color. So the trend is fairly un, uh, unreversible unre uh, at this point in time. So within that, the groups that I try to explore and give some type of quantitative and qualitative analysis of, um, African Americans, Latinos, Asian Americans, Native Americans, and Arab Americans. Mm -hmm. The group I try to give some explanation of, as well as their, uh, you know, quantitative numbers that they represent within the population, as well as their geographic distribution, as well as some sense of the uh, historical journey. And I think that that says a lot about America when you start to look at these different pieces in that, in that fashion. The fact that so many of the Native Americans are in this band running from North Dakota down to Arizona, when the whole country used to be on the East Coast, says a lot about the history of this country. It's not accidental, right, that the large, the majority of, uh, of African Americans live in the south of the former slaveholding state. That the majority of Latinos live in what was once Mexico, in terms of the southwest in this country. That so, that the, I don't know if it's the majority, but the large numbers of Asian Americans live on the west coast, which is where people came over from Asia. So the, the history of the country is manifested through the geographic distribution. I think that's actually an interesting tale um, in terms of um, understanding better how we got to be where we are, who we are as a country. Mm -hmm. uh, now, and in, in your book, you do talk about how much you respect our president. Um, and I don't need to kind of go through it all, although I have it in my notes. But I'd like to shift the focus a little bit to um, leaders of the Democratic Party, uh, of whom I would say you are I don't want to say critical, but you can say critical, critical, <laughs> critical, <laughs> somewhat critical, uh, and you make the case uh, that leaders of the party and progressive whites both have failed to take advantage of the demographic revolution that you talk about. Please tell us how and why you think this is the case. What what have they done wrong? Yeah, so I'm actually work. I was working on the train on the way up here on a piece that I'm going to hopefully run in the nation next week on this exact point. And so, I mean, I really feel that this, this election represents a profound moment of truth for the country as a whole, for the Republican Party, and for the Democratic Party. And so in the country as a whole, it's are we going to be a white country or are we going to be a multiracial country? And so actually, I saw a, a survey. Somebody said they'd surveyed the Trump supporters, and they were saying, when was America great? In terms of make America great again. And most of them said late 50s. Right, so before Voting Rights Act, before Immigration <laughs> Nationality Act, country was 90% white back at that point in time. So the Republicans have a choice and a struggle that they're engaged in. And then interestingly, many of them were ahead of the Democrats before Trump entered the race, in terms of really understanding the need to explicitly and aggressively appeal to people of color, right. putting forward Rubio and then right. Deb Bush's campaign. So they have that. Then the Democrats have a similar piece around, are they going to embrace and invest in and really build their coalition on the communities of color? 46% of Obama's voters are people of color. So that expanding the electorate, mobilizing large numbers of people of color is clearly the path to victory. And I would, uh, yet people don't, the, and this is the piece I'm working on right now. So if you, there's been about $200 million plans for political spending that have been articulated thus far on the progressive and democratic side, 75 plus percent of that is to target white voters and is to target white swing voters. And the mindset still remains that to win an election, you've got to get that shrinking sector of the electorate, which is the, the white swing voter, which is why I explicitly call it in my chapter is requiem for the white swing voter, is to call that question more explicitly. But that's not how the uh, party and its leaders are thinking and functioning and moving, moving forward in that regard. 
Uh, I'm just crunching these numbers. Even, right even today, even with oh, Hillary even today, this is this is the spending that the, is being laid out that it's going to be go after Trump. Mm -hmm. That 75 percent of it's going to go after the swing voters. So there are 5.8 million swing voters by the uh, uh, if you look at that's how many Obama got of the 9% the of all voters decided in the last 10 days. So that Obama got 5.8 million. So it was about, it's really only about how do you hold that 5.8 million. There are 10 million people of color who voted in 2012 and did not vote in 2014. So you can make a calculation around which is the most important voter population to actually go after. And there's another uh, almost 20 million people of color who are eligible and did not vote. And 79% of people of color vote Democratic. And so where do you invest your time, energy, and resources in terms of really trying to build a majority coalition? Do you create capacity? Do you put people on the ground? Do you try to mobilize and increase participation of voters of color? Or do you switch back to really trying to persuade the likely voters who are more white in that regard? And I think that that is the central tension within the Democratic Party and the progressive movement overall. And I think it's also a, a challenge in terms of the larger um, public policy realm as well, right? I mean, tech, talking the introduction about what does this have to do with health? So one of the, uh, uh, I think, most inspiring examples of a public policy change with implications for philanthropists as well as just individual, you know, donors and activists is, was we had the uh, whole greenhouse gas emission, the cap that was passed and this bipartisan bill with Schwarzenegger and the, and the, and the Democrats. But in trying to implement that, and what the regulations would look like, and how that actually would play itself out in terms of this whole polluter pays concept, they could not get progress on that to be able to have it be done in a way that's equitable, that spoke to the low-income communities and communities of color. And it was only when the leadership changed, and it wasn't about changing the minds of the decision makers or changing the minds of the persuadable people, it's when you manifested the power of the growing numbers that you changed who the governor was and you changed who the head of the state senate was that we're able to move this whole polluter pays legislation through and now 500 uh, million dollars a year is moving into low-income communities to improve their health conditions to improve their overall situation and that was because the policy was ultimately then tied to the demographic changes which brought about much more progressive possibilities in terms of what was possible in the public policy space. I agree with that. So let's continue with this idea then of making sure that Democrats get it right. Um, uh, in the book you talk about um, taking basically some percentage of the $1 billion raised each and every cycle and making sure that it's, it's spent with an eye toward the long term. And in the book you uh, talk about where those investments, long-term investments, uh, should be made in people, organizations, and places. So, Steve, maybe you can talk about how you think those, what those investments should be to make the new American majority a permanent coalition. And you, you've touched on it a little bit, but maybe we can go a little deeper. So I would say a couple of things. And one is um, there is a level of uh, structural change which can be transformative. Right, and so we're going to talk some more, I think, in the, in the panel part, but the work that um, Kathy Fung and Common uh, Cause California did around the democratic reforms, right. online voter registration, right. after online voter registration was finally implemented, after it had not passed the first year, that um, 800,000 people registered to vote within six weeks, right. and so changing the composition of the electorate um, in that fashion. <clears throat> so that, those structural things, this automatic registration piece now that um, mm -hmm. Secretary Padilla has put forward, those are types of things which are significant. So the other thing with people, places, um, organizations, is that ongoing effective voter mobilization work requires resourced community-based institutions and organizations that have the res respect and uh, um, credibility within the various communities. And so we need to be able to provide, and there are a lot of uh, social service organizations that have broad reach and credibility, but don't necessarily have the resources or capacity or training to get that their uh, constituency to vote. And so making sure that there are civic engagement coordinators, people whose staff job is they're paid to make sure that everyone they come in contact with is registered to vote, knows when the election is, turns out. We could have lots of those people also at the 
uh, uh, place within faith-based institutions. In terms of everybody in a church or a you know, faith institution would actually be registered to vote and would know when the election was and would have assistance getting to the polls. That can really infuse the participation um, of larger numbers of people. And is this the sort of thing that PowerPack has done in the past? Yeah, so we've done that and tried to move resources in that direction. We've tried to partner with other organizations who are doing that kind of work on an on ongoing basis, right? So um, Anthony Thigpen out of Los Angeles has built probably the gold standard program where all the community organization, community-based organizations in, in Los Angeles and uh, uh, um, his section of Los Angeles would feed into a centralized organization which could then give people uh, precinct walking lists People could go walk their list in their particular area, give it back over to Anthony's organization, which gets fed into a common database, which gets built out. And that's how we build a, a, a identified voter list of progressive voters from 50,000 people up to 500,000 people through that kind of permanent ongoing work. But it requires community-based organizations and leaders to have the resources to do this in ways that build upon the credibility and relationships that they have. And yeah, we will come back to this when we have the panel, other panelists come up. Uh, just, if you wouldn't mind, just quickly, just tell us a little bit about uh, something you talk about in the book uh, that you call the Justice and Equity Fund. Mm -hmm. which is a, and that's a little different than what we're talking about now. So, leading into that, one of the things I think one of the, my, my big takeaways is I do want, I, it's, I mean, a publisher would push me to think, think bigger and like what would a blue sky agenda look like, et cetera. And I've increasingly come to kind of my, it's my Oprah message or whatnot, but it was to us to feel more empowered that we really are and should be the people who are leading society and to not be mired down in um, self-censoring our agenda because we're afraid of what the backlash is gonna be from the swing voters, the moderate voters, et cetera. So in that context, I began to think about what would be possible. So the journey to that is there's a lot of discussion now and a fairly broad acceptance, I'd say, around inequality within our society. We have to be, tackle that. Mm -hmm. Mainly gets articulated in terms of um, income inequality, where people's salaries are. A deeper level of analysis is to look at wealth inequality in terms of what people have, the assets that they actually have. And then that conversation really you could only properly appreciate when you deal with the racial wealth gap in this country. Right? The average white family has uh, about $150,000 in assets. The average black family has about $10,000 in assets, similarly for Latinos. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of implications of that. Now, either it's the that people of color are less talented, not smart, don't actually know how to you know, have the discipline to pull themselves up, or there's something larger and more structural going on. If you actually step back and think about when has America not had a racial wealth gap? That from the very beginning, when people came and took the country and saw the valuable tobacco land and brought people over to work at enslaved uh, conditions, we've had this racial wealth gap. And then in addition to the active role of the government after World War II, GI Bill uh, moved billions of dollars in to create the American middle class when it was largely and explicitly, in terms of loan guarantees, denied to people of color. My own family couldn't buy our home in Cleveland Heights, Ohio, originally. They wouldn't sell it to my parents because they were black. That creates this racial wealth gap. So then if you want to think about the potential around wealth, because public policy always gets um, restricted by where you find the money. If you tax people, then how far down the ladder do you go, et cetera. It took a long time to actually find this number, right? But the top 1% in this country in terms of wealth is people who have $13 million in assets collectively have $26 trillion in assets. You could end poverty in this country, this is where the, the, mm -hmm. the, uh, the fund comes out to talk about, without taxing, raising taxes a dime on 99% of the people in the country. A 2% wealth tax on the top 1% would generate $500 billion a year. Think tanks have done the analysis around what it would take to lift everybody up above the poverty line, it's about $270 billion a year. And you're not even actually making anybody poor. Right? The stock market returns since 1928 on average have been 10% on your assets. So we're not even saying to the top 1% that we're going to take money away from you. We're just saying get richer a little slower and we can end poverty within this country. <laughs> <laughs> That's excellent. Um, can I have about what, five, five or 10 more minutes? Okay. 
So I want to go where I'm sure a lot of people's heads are right now, and that's just kind of what's happening today with the presidential elections. And I'd like you to talk a little about your views of, um, you know, with the kind of voters that Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump in particular bring into the electoral process, how you think they might be changing the conditions of an emergent um, new American majority. So well, I have three questions. Uh, you probably have quick answers for each of them. Uh, first one has to do with, you know, what, what impact, if any, will Trump's presidential bid have on the country's path toward a lasting new American majority? I, just the bid itself, just get to the scenario of he become, actually becomes president. Right. So. Oh, I <laughs> genuinely believe that the intensity and the passion around Trump supporters is that those people who are backing him, uh, who one are people who are uncomfortable at best and hostile at worst, the country's changing the demogra mm -hmm. demographics, um, and they feel in an inchoate sense that this is their last best chance to turn back the tide and not have the country move forward in the direction that it is moving forward. So it's, the stakes are tremendous in that regard. And I would, from my standpoint as a Democrat, be tremendously cataclysmic. Not even a Democrat, the people who cares about not having 12 million people who are Mexican descent rounded up and shipped out and all Muslims right. banned and having a religious test around who can come into the country. So the stakes are huge at, at, at that level. I also believe that it is their last best chance and that the uh, progress that was um, embodied by and accelerated by Obama as the president can't will be basically irreversible and it will prove for the la that this was the death knell of a winning strategy being uh, running on racial resentment. And so you can argue going back to the whole Southern strategy, the late 60s and Nixon's law and order, that that has been the essence of the Republican approach. And mathematically, it has largely at least made them competitive if not actually worked. But if this fails, if he fails, then that strategy, I believe, will fail, which will be to the benefit of the country. And it will be benefit, actually, to both parties, because then the Republicans will get back on that track of trying to you know, compete mm -hmm. and attract people of color. But then Democrats will have to get better around being able to address people. Because Democrats have never had to make an argument around their, why they're better for people of color. They just right. said, we're not the crazy people over there. <laughs> All right. So, right. so but now they're going to have to spell out specifically why they are better when they're actually competing. And that, I think, will be to the benefit overall of the body politic. And conversely, if, pre if Trump is elected president, then is it the death knell? Well, I think it's a question of, uh, of um, it will, it will slow the process. It will be a significant setback, and it will slow these changes by 10 or right. 20 years. Right. And so that's, the, that's what I think was really what is at stake, as well as in terms of the public policy agenda. Right, and so this uh, uh, likely the next president will appoint at least one Supreme Court justice, if not more. Um, Citizens more. United, the immigration reform, these hang in one. They're in the balance. Right. In that the immigration reform uh, li uh, lit 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 the litigation that's before the court, um, if it doesn't come down or if it's deferred through the executive this, order, the executive order. A new Supreme Court justice right. can uphold and validate that. So that millions of people's lives are at stake in terms of what um, the outcome of this election is going to be. Uh, we have five minutes, so I, I want to go down a slightly different path, but again within the context of uh, presidential, uh, presidential race and that scenario involving Hillary Clinton. So if Hillary uh, is elected president, what is your level of confidence that the young progressive minor voters that Bernie Sanders is bringing into the process going to become a constituency that will help strengthen the permanent progressive governing coalition that you talk about? Well, that's some level of the, is the challenge is what they're facing now. Um, there's also, I think, I've been arguing that the, you know, it looks like it will likely be Hillary, but whoever the Democratic nominee is, right. needs to choose a running mate who is a younger, inspiring person of color to balance mm -hmm. that ticket out. And that's going to be important both in terms of the electorally to win, to reach those constituencies. 
Um, and some of those people on her short list, supposedly, people who would meet that profile anyway. Well, it'll be interesting to see. This is, gets back to their strategic calculation. Right. Right. And so it's not a, there's never been a person of color as a vice presidential nominee or vice president in this country. That's not a qualifications issue. Right. right. I, mean, that, I mean, Dan Quayle put that to rest. Right. <laughs> and so that's a question of what you think the electorate will tolerate. Right. And so I, I do worry that they're going to go this traditional route around trying to win over the moderate white swing voters by choosing another white man for that right. position. Whereas she could choose somebody like Cory Booker or Labor Secretary Tom Perez, somebody who would be more inspiring and galvanizing people. Um, so that I think there's that piece. I do think it's important to realize that uh, my understanding is the majority of younger people of color have actually supported Hillary. Right. So although that's a mixed thing, it's not as much as the older people of color are. Right. So it I'm really is more than the young people. I'm just or young say, white people. Uh, young white people. people. In yep. terms of what what Bernie's base has yep. been, and so I do think that being able to inspire them, mm -hmm. and also do not, I do not think it should be minimized, the significance of electing the country's first woman as president, and I think that Fair we enough. have not fully appreciated the significance of electing the first um, African American. I don't think we'll know for another decade or two the psychological and cultural advantage of having all of these young people grow up with this first family in the White House. And I think similarly for girls and for boys, to see a woman as president right. will be salutary for the country. I think we all agree with that. Uh, my last question is just going to be, what are, would you, else would you like to say? We have a couple more minutes left before we go, go to the panel. Is there anything else you want to say to us? Well, I think in terms of the California piece, that this also plays into the, uh, I think, when the message that this new American majority exists in California, in a lot of ways, it, it, California was on the forefront of it. And yet, it's still not exactly how public policy and social change is thought about. And so, I didn't even realize until doing research fairly recently that the majority of eligible voters in California are now people of color. And so, that was 2014, 49% of eligible voters. That's not just, the, I mean, the majority of the population has been for a while, but not everybody has had no, been uh, uh, eligible in terms of citizenship basis. Mm -hmm. So, one could argue you could win just with people of color, right, in that regard. Then, but I also think, and this is a, maybe a, a critical point, is that people do not appreciate um, how many progressive whites there are. And that, so it's not a majority. People just, it gets dismissed. But I would argue that there's a floor that's around 34%. So when um, Schwarzenegger was reelected in his big old landslide <coughs> election, Angelini still got 34% of the white vote. And that's roughly what the floor has been nationally for Democrats. So if people of color are the majority of all of the eligible voters, and you've got 34% of the white people, why do you have to go chasing the moderate to conservatives in terms of being able to get their support? And I think we saw that play itself out in terms of that struggle, but also in terms of what the policy implications are around the minimum wage and the fight for 15. So the governor did not want to have 15 dollars minimum wage. But when it was put on the ballot, and he at least was smart enough to realize that the electorate has changed now and that the voters in this state would support that, right. that then accelerated that policy And the fact change. that he didn't want him to spend all that money um, in this cycle. Uh, was one right, trying to, didn't want to, right, trying to fight so. that. But I think fundamentally he realized it was going to pass right. because the electorate's composition has changed and the electorate is much more progressive um, than people often realize within um, the positions of power. And so I think that's my you know, fundamental and concluding message is that is to carry ourselves with the confidence that we do, in fact, have a majority, and that we do not need to be limited anymore by our fears of what the moderates or the conservatives will think and feel, and we should be moving much more boldly and aggressively to put forward policy solutions that create the kind of society we want to see. Great, great concluding remark. Uh, <laughs> Remind everybody who's coming after me on this panel to turn your mics on. I can turn mine off. Good material there, Steve. Okay.
Uh, I'm going to start with some introductions. Uh, let me start with Mindy Romero, who's to our right with the red jacket. Uh, Mindy's pretty well known uh, for people who do politics for a living. Um, she describes herself as a political sociologist. She received her PhD from UC Davis, as well as her other degrees, I believe. Uh, she is the founder and director of the California Civic Engagement Project at the Center for Regional Change at UC Davis. Her research focuses on political behavior and race and ethnicity, as well as patterns of polit political underrepresentation. Mindy is a frequent information source and commentator uh, in print and broadcast outlets, including the Washington Post, the Los Angeles Times, the Sacramento Bee, uh, NPR affiliated stations I know, KFBK, et cetera. Uh, she also works with state lawmakers, voter education groups, and community advocates to strengthen political participation and representation. So, Mindy, thank you for being here. Does your mic work? It will. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you have time to get it on. Uh, to Steve's right, we have Kathy Feng. Uh, Kathy's been a political activist and civil rights attorney in California for more than 15 years. Uh, she currently wears two hats for Common Cause. She is the executive director of California Common Cause and the national redistricting director for Common Cause. Uh, she has successfully championed election and campaign finance reforms such as online voter registration and creation of an independent citizens redistricting commission for California, which has now become a national model. Uh, Kathy's work is also focused on the voting rights of traditionally disenfranchised <coughs> communities. Uh, welcome, Kathy. Uh, and then uh, to our left is uh, Philip Rodriguez. Uh, Philip is an award-winning filmmaker. He received his MFA in film and television from UCLA. Uh, he currently is director of city projects and a fellow at the Annenberg School of Communication and Journalism at USC. Uh, he's won many award-winning documentaries. I'll mention two of them. Race uh, 2012, a conversation about race and politics. And Brown is the New Green, uh, George Lopez and the American Dream. Uh, his work has been described by the Washington Post as, I love this one, higher truth telling. And after spending time with him, I can see why they said that. Uh, and thoughtful by the New York Times. Uh, so these are our panelists, um, and I'm just going to start with a simple question to everyone except Steve, <laughs> and that is, before I start throwing questions at the group, I, I'd be curious to hear anybody's comments uh, about Steve's book, because I, I think all of you read his book, or any of the comments that he made uh, during our conversation, anything at all, just to kind of open things up. Do we agree with what Steve is saying? Uh, well, well, should I go? I mean... I think it was a bit of a Trojan horse. You know, it kind of begins with this kind of hopeful scenario, three friends from Stanford uh, coalescing, and, and it ends up, I think, being a very, very caution, a great, very useful cautionary tale about the difficulties ahead for any kind of white progressive and non-white coalition. Um, and I'm, I'm at the moment, in my political life, not, uh, I'm, not I'm rather, rather pessimistic about the op 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 possibility of, of this, at least in this generation, of white folks and non-white folks on the left uh, finding a common ground that's, um, that's, uh, that's coordinated, that's not, that's, not, that's not dictated by whites exclusively, and that's, that's genuinely inclusive, and uh, that's sustainable. So uh, I really appreciated the work. Good. Thank you, Philip. Uh, I have one comment. Steve Phillips for California Governor, 2018. Um, <laughs> I thought you were my friend. Oh. <laughs> that's great. Uh, that, that's after we get public financing, so you don't have to suck up to all the major donors. Um, so I am um, excited and ready to take on the challenge. Uh, I think that this is something that we've been talking about but I think it also requires a mindset shift of all of us in this room. Um, let me take the little bit of um, one of the statistics that, that Steve shared and play that story out a little bit more. Uh, so in 2012, after what was a much harder fight than it should have been, um, we finally got 
uh, online voter registration passed in California, and in the first month of implementation, so the month of October, just before the November 2012 election, 800,000 people used this new system to register to vote. Of those 800,000 people, one third were under the age of 25. Now, if folks will remember what was on the ballot, Proposition 30 proposed to increase taxes and much of that money was going to go towards public education. Young people in this state made a very concerted decision, it wasn't by coincidence, to get involved in 2012 because they were tired of bearing this huge student debt even when attending a public university or college. Um, and I think a lot of parents wanted to invest in it because as a parent of a nine-year-old, I was tired of seeing class sizes of 35 kids to one teacher and having to make hard decisions about whether you're going to hire an intervention teacher to help those kids most in need. What I will say is that that year, Proposition 30 was passed. And it's the first time, and you probably know this number better, how many decades, that a tax increase was passed by California voters. Okay. PPIC, the Pub Public Policy Institute of California, talks a lot about this thing called the exclusive electorate. So in California, we've got two things going on. We've got the state population, we've got those people who are eligible to vote, and then we've got those people who actually vote. And those people who actually vote has, in 2006, they reported that it was very exclusive. That group of people who voted did not look like the population at large. The more that we start investing in policies that get the group of people who vote to look as broad and diverse as the people who live in this state, the more that we're going to see policy choices that are inclusive and, as Steve says, are progressive. So the responsibility now is on those of us who care about this country to say, how do we move from being a defensive, in a defensive mode, to, frankly, shaping policy? Um, and I love this idea of thinking about blue skies, right? And I say this because I used to work for the Asian Pacific American Legal Center, which is now Asian Americans Advancing Justice. But like groups like MALDEF and uh, uh, ACP LDF, defense was built into their name because what they had was, I need to defend my civil rights. I need to defend voting rights. I need to defend against police abuse. I need to defend, I need to defend against policies that were and institutions that are built against me. But what happens when we're in positions of power? We got to change that thinking. Because the most dangerous thing that we could do is to step into those positions of power and only recreate the mechanisms of oppression that were used against us. So my friends sometimes will ask, well, why do you want redistricting reform? Besides, like, what is redistricting? Well, why do you want that? <laughs> I know, it's boring. But, you know, the, the, the Democrats would say that. Why do you want redistricting reform? We finally have Democrats who are in power. We finally have people of color in, who are in power. Why should we give that power up to some group of citizens to draw those lines? And the reason why is I do not want to recreate those systems of oppression just because, quote, unquote, we are in power. I don't do that. I'm sorry, I'm getting really teary-eyed. And so I, similarly, I think when we think about a lot of posi uh, positions that we now take, whether that is about money and politics, whether that's about how we make decisions in government, who holds those positions of power, how people are elected and who they're getting money from, we need to think about changing those policies so that once we are in power, we have the ability to really affect change in a way that builds a society that is humane to each other, that is inclusive, um, and, and embraces the change that's coming. So Mindy, I have uh, some questions that I, I, can, I can set this up for you really nicely, if you trust me. Do I trust you? <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? Should I trust him? Yeah. OK. <laughs> you don't have to. <laughs> uh, so I thought what we could do. What I was going to say was brilliant, but go ahead. <laughs> Um, I thought what we could do was maybe focus a little bit more on things that you talk about and write about. 
everything. And that's... Well, that's everything. <laughs> voter <laughs> registration, voter turnout, the things that we've already mm -hmm. had some discussions around. So, I mean, everybody in this room knows that California's electorate certainly does not reflect the diversity uh, of our adult population, adult mm -hmm. voting population. Um, and I thought I would throw a few numbers out, and this is across, you know, all the demographic indicators, race, uh, you know, age, education, income, et cetera, all the stuff we see in polling data. Mm -hmm. uh, so in California, the adult population uh, today is 42% white and 36% Latino. I, I have uh, updated numbers for you. Okay, please. <laughs> Only because this really was a, a watershed moment, for lack of a better word. Um, just a couple of years ago, it was estimated by both the Census and the California Department of Finance, so everybody's in agreement. Um, that Latinos are now a plurality of the state's population. They've now surpassed white in terms of being having the largest um, proportion. Um, is that what you said? Did you say? You yeah, said, I, I yeah. should qualify this likely to vote because I got these numbers from people. Oh, likely to vote. Okay, yeah. That. There's. It does matter how you slice You're the numbers. Right, right, population sorry. likely to vote. Eligible voter population. Population of voters themselves. Okay. Yep. Yes. Uh, Gosh, I, I thought I was giving you an exciting new no. number. <laughs> but uh, but. But among those who do vote or have a propensity to vote, mm -hmm. likely voters, uh, today 42% um, are white. I'm sorry, 60% are white, and only 18% are Latino. Mm. Uh, moreover, today 82% of the state's adults are eligible to vote, but only 57% are actually registered to vote. Again, according to PPIC's last report, which came out a month or two ago. And of those who are registered, only about half are projected to turn out in the November 2016 election. I don't know if you agree with that or not, but that's what I've been reading. I assume it's true. So to kind of get focused on some of these dynamics, maybe what you could tell us about is some of the research that you're, you've seen or that you've done uh, that speaks to why voter turnout has been so low over the past decade. Okay. Um, well, I think one important point, uh, and that report, I think you're pulling those numbers from in case folks want to find it later. It's uh, the report on the exclusive electorate. It's an update of a report they did 10 years ago, and I know Kathy just Where mentioned it a few moments ago. Um, not only, I, just to make this point up front, not only does our voting electorate, that's the pie of all actual voters, right? Uh, it is not representative. It does not look like the pie of all voters, nor does it look like the pie of all eligible voters in California. Um, but it hasn't changed much in the last 10 years. I think that's really important. Right. So the proportions have changed, right? So it does have more voters of color, for instance. But it's not keeping, it, it's still out of whack. It's still not representative. And it's not, that we're not gaining ground in terms of representation. We're gaining ground in terms of greater, greater percentages of all voters, but it's not keeping pace with the demographic population changes. Does that make sense? By and large. Mm -hmm. So it's exciting to see more voters of color, period, and larger percentages. But when you look at, we compare it to the percent of the eligible voter population, those still aren't, we're out of alignment. And it hasn't really improved much. Um, so I think that's an important point. Um, and I think then you were asking me why do we have low turnout? Uh, as my thinking has evolved, I think I break it down really now in, in two areas. Uh, it is still not, um, our voting system is still not completely accessible to everyone. We need to make it easier for folks to vote, the access question, the structural question, the institutional dynamics. And we need to make people want to vote. That's the motivation question. Mm -hmm. And we need to work on both fronts. And California has made a lot of progress. Uh, Common Cause and Kathy has been amazing leaders in this, um, in the last few, few years particularly uh, in the reform area, in the access area, so online voter registration, which we're seeing huge numbers, not just in 2012, but right now, over the last few months, incredible online, we're about to release a major report saw that, uh, yesterday ourselves on it, yeah. yeah. Um, and, and automated voter registration, we're calling it automated and automatic, so we may want to talk about it in the Q&A, some of the exciting elements of it, but still, some questions on that. still limitations around it. Um, and other reforms. Um, but so even though we're in many ways in recent years kind of out there and forward, um, better do, doing more than many other states, um, we still have uh, a huge proportion of the population that's of color, that's historically underrepresented, um, that are voting in much lower percentages, period. 
And um, I think there's these other elements. I mean, we still have to look at additional reforms. Um, but then there is the lack of outreach and mobilization. Um, and I talk about this often, but our political, yeah, and I know you talk about it, our political system is um, very much still structured where campaigns and candidates, right, parties, are the dominant players. They're the ones that you get mobilized or asked to vote. It's typically by campaigns and candidates. And they still use the likely move voter model. This is why it's so important to get them to accept these numbers and move. And um, But still, with that model, um, Latinos are seen as a sleeping giant. I don't know if I want to spend my precious resources, my camp res uh, campaign resources, right, um, to folks that I think are going to be a hard sell. Um, young people are seen as non-voters. They don't get the outreach. You kind of name the group. Um, and so that matters. And, uh, you know, there's many other structures as well, but I'll talk about civics for a moment. I really think that uh, when we talk about civics education, first of all, it's abysmal, period, although there's some great, bright, shining spots across the state, and there's some new momentum in California around the power of democracy, if you've heard that. Um, but overall, it's still pretty abysmal. And where we do see the bright, shining spots, or the really creative teacher, or the particularly motivated principal, we're not seeing it most of the time, by and large, in the communities of color. And so what we have is, a, a, in some ways, a widening, a potential widening of the gap um, with youth of color, right, and youth from low-income communities. Um, and so we need to focus on our civics, but we need to think about it in terms of um, cutting a very wide demographic swath and, and getting to all communities. Um, and then also at a community organizational level, um, there are so many groups that ha share common dynamics, um, common goals, common audiences. They're all going for the same city council, the same policymakers. Um, but when it comes to actual voter education and mobilization, if that's not explicitly what they do, if they're interested in other issues, they have very few resources to, to put it also towards registration and mobilization. Or maybe they do it around a given election, but they don't, they don't do it in the long game. If I so, may, Jose, yeah, I'd like please. to address yeah. a question to you. Um, uh, um, you, 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 prevent, you, prevent some, you present some very damning data about the Democratic Party and its, and its priorities. And one of the pieces of information that struck me so powerfully, in the last three election cycle, the party has spent 97% of its, of its resources on white consultants and white businesses, right? Yes. So the, the, despite the fact that 40% of its voting base is non-white, it's still, some, it's, it's still a, a, a white boys club, right, on the inside. To, and to what degree is this a product of, of the Democratic Leadership Council uh, phenomenon that uh, Clinton and, and uh, Al Gore and, and that generation of Democrats put in place in response to, to the, the loss of the South, the loss of the, uh, of the, uh, the Reagan Democrats? And is there a political will within the party to, to construct something similar uh, to promote the agenda that, that, that your book articulates so well? Well, we're going to see. I mean, this election, I think, in a lot of ways is going to, is going to, going to show that. I mean, I have increasingly come to, I mean, it's funny, because I, I consider myself actually quite optimistic in the largest sort of sense, but I'm also kind of like, um, I feel some of the, the same frustrations that you're talking about. And I've increasingly come to use the phrase apartheid, that there's an apartheid structure within the progressive movement and within the Democratic Party. Whereas you're a party of 46% people of color in almost every single large, certainly large budgeted aspect of the, of the party is run by whites. And it's, and it's already playing itself out, as I was talking about, in the terms of the allocations, right? So Priorities USA is going to be the big super PAC. And so they're going to spend, they've already allowed like $130 million. The lion's share of that's going to go towards television ads. I mean, it's all going towards uh, ads. None of it's going to mobilize people. And the lion's share of that is going to be negative ads attacking Trump. You could take those tens of millions of dollars and hire people to work in the communities of color to be able to do voter mobilization work, voter turnout work, in a much more effective and empirically supported fashion. So that this is the struggle and the challenge. And so I think. Part of the reason I'm you know, taking my time to go around the country is to kind of stir this up to have this discussion so it doesn't just play itself out. I do think it's a broader issue. I think the DLC piece was part of it, but I think it's a much larger, longer-term phenomenon. I mean, 
who has run this country and who has run the dominant institutions have been white people for the long, yeah, of long course, time. Of course, but they were taking back the night. I mean, to use the phrase from the 70s, right? They were taking back the party from the Rainbow Coalition, effectively. And they, they, they had diagnosed, or certain members of, that, of the party, had diagnosed the, the disastrous loss of the Reagan Revolution to the loss of the Southern white male. And they were simply trying to take it back for, for this voter that they're still, the swing voter, that they're still preoccupied right, and that's with. what I feel is the, that I feel is the battle right now. So that is exactly what happened. We used to call it DLC, Democrats with Leisure Class. <laughs> and then along comes Obama, who mobilizes all these people of color and who wins the election off of the strength of the larger numbers of mobilized people of color. And so now we are in the first post-Obama election. Which direction are we going to go? Are we going to invest in the Obama coalition? We're going to go back to chasing the white swing voter. And the early, si the early signs of the independent side are not encouraging. I actually do think many people in the uh, um, campaign apparatus of Clinton shop have come out of the Obama world and do see the importance of being able to organize in that community. But a lot of the senators don't. A lot of the independent side doesn't. And this is the struggle that we have to have this year. And I'm, I'm trying to contribute to that debate um, as aggressively as possible right now. Can I just, uh, interject your question here? I don't want to stop the flow of the conversation. but whether or not the right strategy is pursued by Democrats. I'm just curious to know from your perspective, what are the advocacy and grassroots organizations today doing to try and inspire voters, especially young people, to come out and vote? Again, regardless of how the elected or the yeah. you know, political candidates spend their money. Is there something going on that we're just not aware of or not reading about? Well. I think we do. I mean, so much of this discussion, of course, is ab about the Democratic Party. And as we know, still statistically, you know, voters of color are going to find their policies or policy alignment within the de Democratic Party. But I think there's a bigger issue here. There's engagement, period. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really important. And, and, I, and I think the more we talk about engagement, period, actually, the more some, there's some groups that would be more receptive to that conversation. Without the and I know why we're talking about the Democratic Party because if they're not listening, then you've got an issue. You're not going to get very far. Um, but there is this, you know, um, as long as we have uh, people burying their heads in the sand in terms of demographic change and in terms of co the coalitions that are present and could be, you know, further need to be further supported, um, then ultimately what comes of that is you end up having still low turnout. You have people have less of a voice, period. The reason people aren't going after the Latino vote or the black vote or the, the, American, the new American majority because of these notions that Steve has explained, but in the end what you have is you have people that have less of a voice, period. So how do we change our culture around voting to, you know, how do we change our culture around voting to influence how people think about the importance of civic engagement? Do you want to say something else? No. So I think that there's a couple different things. And I, I thought that you were right to sort of break this down into how do we make our electoral systems more accessible so it's removing barriers, but then also how do you motivate people to come out and vote? On the, so let's talk about the motivation piece because the removing barriers is great. And the moment that somebody has a click moment and they say, okay, I want to go out and vote or I'm going to go and register, it's important that we have things like same day registration and online voter, online registration. voter registration and you know eventually maybe even portable voting or something far more convenient. Mm -hmm. um, but how do you get people to click? Um, and so what I would say is number one, um, we need to be honest about the cynicism that a lot of young people mm -hmm. feel about our government and who we elect. And the feeling is I can get inspired by somebody for the moment, but once I get into the system, they just behave like everybody else. And, and there's a little bit of that around President Obama. Maybe we put too much in him, and maybe we don't take enough ownership on ourselves, but there's a lot of feeling like, why didn't he do all these things? Um, so that's, that's one piece, is that I think for a lot of us, what we need to think about is every time we talk about the potential for political change, um, we need to think about it a little bit more deeply and not just connect it to our heroes and messiahs, but to talk about how if we're going to have change, it's got to be a consistent effort that sticks with it and assumes that the responsibility and the power lies in the electorate, not in the people that we elect. Okay, that's number one. Number two, I think we do need to connect um, 
we need to connect the dots for people about you know, when you come out to vote, the difference that it makes. So I think the story, for instance, in 2012 about the passage of Prop 30 is that when a larger and more representative electorate comes out, and who that is, right, that's mm -hmm. young people, that's people of color, but it's also the progressive white majority or minority percentage, um, that, it, that it, it creates a large section of the electorate that then makes policy choice, choices that are different, right? And so, again, the ownership that, that this thing that we talk about, you know, voting and democracy, that when we play it out in real life, um, that there are, there are real tangible results. And we need to tell those stories. So one of the stories that I think you know, I tell a lot is um, when the governor decided to come down with a new formula um, on how to allocate funding for our elementary schools, K through 12, um, middle schools and high schools, um, and decided to focus that funding on uh, schools that had a high percentage of minorities, mm -hmm. uh, immigrants, uh, English learners. Um, it had a tremendous effect on our, on our school, my school. Um, when I talk about that to my community, which is now 60% Asian American, there is a light bulb that goes off. And when I connect that to the, the fact that if you vote, you can continue to support people who will vote for policies that come back to your neighborhood. But if you don't, you will be actively ignored. Because between politicians and political consultants, they know exactly who does not vote. And they, they choose to focus on those who do. Um, and that is the political reality. I think that, that a lot of times that both push and pull helps to get people to the ballot box. Um, hopefully we invest in a new generation and I think, so here's the interesting piece that I've also been thinking about. I don't know when this happens, I'm sure somebody's written a book about it, that um, there is a generation of young people who got turned off by polit politics and went into the nonprofit sector, went into volunteerism. Dan Schnur oftentimes talks about how millennials actually are very active in their lives. They volunteer they are. at a higher percentage than mm -hmm. any other volunteer generation. generation. Volunteer mm -hmm. generation. But they do feel cynical about government and politics being able to be responsive. And I think we bear some of that responsibility, right? Um, somewhere along the line, we, we all got so disenchanted with the possibility of what government could do that we all checked out, including me, you know? Um, so this is an interesting piece where there, we need to think about how we change that conversation and how we create sort of positive modeling, not just negative modeling, which means you know, finding good people and nudging and pushing them to run for office who aren't just you know, slimy, you know, slimy and oh, okay, I'll fine, twist my arm, I'll vote for that person. That's how I feel these days, right? And I, I would like to have candidates who I feel inspired by once again, but that, that rests on us as well. Yeah, can I just add into that? Because I think that I was at an event where somebody from uh, I think it was Oakland Rising was saying that people in the community see social change protagonist as somebody else. And even if it's elected officials, that, that other, but we don't see ourselves as the people actually driving that kind of a change. And so that really stuck with me. And I think it's actually, we have to tell this story. And I also think we have, those of us on the progressive or left side of the spectrum, I think you have to engage in more struggle. I think it's extraordinarily dangerous. Almost, I feel it's almost as dangerous as like a right-wing plot to get so many progressives to look down on politics and look down on electoral politics. Well, that actually, I believe, is where the power actually resides. But we haven't connected it up. One of the things that's most hopeful to me are these recent efforts to move the Black Lives Matter movement into a, the political process to go after these district attorneys. And so in Chicago, right, we didn't just, pro we protested the, the state's attorney there who didn't bring charges, we tried to cover up the shooting of Oklahoma McDonald, but pushed it also to the polls and took her out of office and actually elected a new person. The same thing happened in Cleveland with the district attorney who, did, who wouldn't bring charges against the cops who killed Tamir Rice. And there's a whole discussion now around district attorney races and being able to field candidates and train operatives. 
that's the kind of tangible connection I think we ought to be making and telling that story so people see politics as more relevant to their lives. And that story really isn't being told much in the media, is it? Yeah. Go ahead. And well, I'll just add. Um, I think there's a there's a short game and a long game, and the problem is politics is always about the short, the short game, right? It's about how are we going to get our party, our candidates, our issues ahead or win in this election. We saw a huge failing of the Republican Party here in California with Proposition 187, which was definitely about the short game in that moment, right? Pete Wilson's chances and and so forth. And that was the initiative to take. Thank you. Public health benefits and education away from people who are un undocumented. Yeah, in 1994, yeah. Um, and what happened was now we're still feeling the effects 20 years later. And just as maybe some people are starting to forget it, not the leaders in the, in the Latino party or Latino community, but maybe some younger folks are starting to forget it, then we have Trump bringing up things all over again. So that's an example of where actually it benefited engagement and, and opening up the electorate and brought Latinos in um, because of that short game. But most of the time, the short game, right, works to just to suppress the vote, to discourage people from participating. And I think ultimately what, at least one of the strongest points that I get from the book is, uh, yes, we, we have the numbers now, right, um, but it really is a long game. I mean, that's one of my conclusions. It really is a long game in the sense that um, I'm trying to change the system, change their approach to educate um, to get folks to, to change their, ultimately, change their tactics. You can, do, you can keep the same tactics um, and you can pursue the same types of voters, but you're not going to get there. Um, but it's, it's beyond campaign tactics, right? It is the broader, how do we get, you asked a moment ago, to get to the culture of voting. We have a culture of non-voting. It's completely socially acceptable in every social group, just about, except for maybe us here in this room, if you don't vote, right? Young people... Totally, completely socially acceptable. We might say, oh, those darn kids, what's wrong with them, right, when we don't you know, provide them any support in voting. So getting to a culture of voting to where voting is supported and expected, that is a fundamental um, basis that, then to, that will make mobilizing right, and strategizing so much easier if you have everybody a, a feeling informed and understanding the impact of voting, understanding right, the process, feeling comfortable and confident in the process, but we also, this other aspect, one last thing, is we don't believe or trust in the system. Many people don't. They're either confused by it, don't feel they can have an impact, not so sure, or they completely, I'm not giving my vote to that politician. Right. And that's a big part of the culture of non-voting. If I may run on this, uh, on this idea of this long, um, long game, uh, it's really a, we're in the midst of a, of a cultural reorganization. That's right. The, the demographic thing is one thing. And but how we think about ourselves, how non-whites think about themselves, no longer playing the defense game, but indeed being leaders of a, of a, of a philanthropic organization, uh, to, uh, being no longer always responding to white, but also, but indeed leading this place as majoritarian folks. And I think that, and I think whites are also going to have to reorganize themselves, no longer implicitly understanding that they are the center of things, that that everything revolves around that the that the that American identity, indeed, like Trumpites uh, 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 have believed, it revolves around their essence. And liberals have very often also felt a noblesse oblige and a kind of paternalistic attitude vis-a-vis -vis things about non-whites that they have to rethink and reorganize. Mm -hmm. So I think it's going to be a long, um, multi-generational uh, process of um, of re reconsidering ourselves at kind of fun fundamental cultural cellular level that we're going to have to. Uh, uh, we're going to what participate do you think in. is the role and potential of, well, two things. One, of art and culture in general, mm -hmm. but also the technology, which is like... Enormous. One, uh, no, no, enormous. I mean, of course, I'm, I'm, I'm a filmmaker. I'm not a, I'm not a practitioner. I'm not a, an expert in the things you all are. I, I make programs that try to get in somebody's head. And the process of trying to, to uh, create a presence of a competent Latino identity in show business nearly impossible mm -hmm. because the show, that, that business, though it's run by white progressives to a large extent, um, is for a whole variety of reasons invested in a previous model, in a, a model of, in sh of, of creating a freak show out of non-whites um, um, as, uh, as, 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 as social pariahs 
as a problem for them to solve. And um, this is this is you know the level of, of culture as uh, is and storytelling is vital to this process. Mm -hmm. And of course, as you suggest, the social media, which has democratized voice, I mean, the notion of you know black Twitter is an unbelievable phenomenon. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's, it's stunning what how how that has uh, what's the term woke me, you know. You know, I mean, I've I, I have has done has done more for my racial consciousness, and I'm I'm non-white, and I was non-white raised in a very white environment, but social media has done more to inform me. And I went to Berkeley, I went to school, I studied third world stuff, but this is is keeping me giving me an old man an eye to to what's afoot and how the culture is transforming, and this is extraordinary. And this is an extraordinary opportunity that. Yeah. And I think social media has also lowered the cost to organize. Mm -hmm. Where before you had to have phone trees or the ability to raise money to mail, what's mail? Um, uh, what's a phone? What's a phone? <laughs> right. What's a stamp? Um, but there, there are seminars on that now. Now, you know, so. no, now <laughs> the ability to reach hundreds, thousands of people who are thinking that same moment of thought, and then to inspire and to get people out and mobilize is huge. Um, so. There's Black Lives Matter. There's Occupy. I mean, when we think about it, there, just in the last three, five, three to five years, there have been these moments of um, huge social movement. I think that we haven't even seen the biggest yet. Um, in that respect, I'm so hopeful about Trump in, in one way, because his bellicose, kind of overt, non-coded white racism is mobilizing Latino youth. Uh, you know, I, I, he's going to burn the place down in, in Anaheim when he comes next time. Mm -hmm. I mean, those kids are not messing around. They're going to go straight at these people. And, you know, fisticuffs, bring it. So, I mean, I love the notion that Trump is heightening the contradiction here. And, is, and, is, and is, you know, the problem with Latinos is because they're neither fish nor fowl, because they don't have a place in the racial binary of America. They're kind of always hoping they can cuddle up with the whites, you know, and kind of be included <laughs> and get the gig. And, you know, when t in the hard times, they go crawl toward blacks and they say, well, maybe we can coalesce and, you know, we, we, got, we got a common agenda. And this is one of those times that Trump's bellicosity and obviousness is a great opportunity for us to reconsider our race once again and our racial allegiances once again. So I'm actually almost for the fucking guy. Uh, <laughs> now everybody tweet that out. <laughs> right, right. That's not an endorsement, right, Philip? No. No. <laughs> Uh, I, I have a little more time left, Carrie, is that right? Ten more minutes? Okay, so I thought one of the areas that we might explore a little bit with the time left is, you know, possibility of uh, federal immigration reform, particularly, you know, if there's a path to citizenship. So I'm just curious to know what you, all of you think about what impact that might actually have on the size and diversity of the electorate for everything that Steve has written about and everything we've been touching on in terms of the structural things that need to be changed. You talk a lot about immigration policy, so, yeah, so I, I want to thank you because Kathy. there's a lot of history that folks don't know. It's been erased. Um, so I'll let you drop some science now because there's, there's a, and that tells you where we're going. Right, well, it's, um, and I'm always, uh, um, Gun shy around people who are actually in academia to try to pretend myself as the expert. But I think that one of the big, the, probably the single most eye opening statistic to me in terms of doing the research was that 74% of Asian American adults are foreign born. Mm -hmm. And like, at first, I couldn't believe that it would be that large. But then you start to go back through the history. And it was essentially illegal for Asians to become U.S. citizens prior to 1965. Right. It's a 1790 law. Uh, you have to be a citizen. You have to be a free white person. It was explicitly good law to the mid-1950s, upheld by the Supreme Court in the 1920s, and in practice of the Asiatic exclusion zones was the pro policy of this government of the 1960s. So almost every Asian American in this country has some connection to this history and this history of exclusion, but even a lot of Asian Americans don't know that. And so then I think it also has an impact on your sense of how the country has treated you and your community and whatnot. And so I think that's just one example, or probably one of the most significant examples of the drivers of the, of the uh, uh, demographic transformation. Asian Americans are actually the largest growing, fastest growing mm -hmm. sector of the population now. And it's partly because of this 
and also just because of the shape of the world, right? It was, um, I guess the Jackson once say that, that Asians are a minority nowhere on this planet, ain't but so much, so much Earth and so many Asians, right? And so that if we had a non-discriminatory <laughs> immigration flow, we would have a much more reflective um, population. I think there's two ways, I would add to that, um, just two ways to think about it. There is literally, and, and many people talk about this, the, the numbers you would gain, right, from immigration reform and, what, and how could that potentially um, impact elections. Um, but I think potentially more importantly is what immigration reform would mean uh, to the party or to the policymakers, elected officials that champion it and get it done. Um, because... For many Latinos, um, immigration reform isn't necessarily their top, actually, if you poll them, it's not, by and large, uh, as a whole, not one of their top items. Um, but it is an important item because it says something about the groups that are, when they're talking about it, right? It says it's not a litmus test, but it can be an indicator of a, a party that supports immigration reform, how they feel about Latinos, how they, how they understand the Latino community, how respectful they are, how inclusionary they are, right? How inclusive they are. And the rhetoric around immigration reform is probably the biggest part of it, right? How people talk about it, what they say and what they don't say um, gives clues to, to people about a party or a candidate, it gives clues to Latinos, particularly about a party or a candidate. And so as a Republican um, many in the Republican Party a couple of years ago um, actively started arguing for supporting immigration reform because they recognized, right, that that would be a signal, right, a very important signal, symbolic signal, and, and tangible signal um, to Latinos about the inclusive and changing nature of the Republican Party. And Latinos and Democrats also got themselves in trouble there for a while uh, around not fulfilling promises, right? So, but... That's where I, when I think about immigration reform, I actually think about the perceptions, the framework, the imagery, and how, how voters take that in. Yeah, no, just add that. I think the right wing understands this, right? And so it's been amusing to me to look at um, Ann Coulter's book, right? Adios America, the left's plan to turn America into a third world hellhole. Um, but her. That's uh, the name of it? Yes. No. <laughs> that sounds like Ann Coulter, book. for sure. Yeah. Um, but her data is actually pretty good. And so she looked at the 65 Immigration Nationality Act. She looked at the change. She looked at how whites have never voted majority for, uh, for, a, Republic, for a Democrat um, since LBJ in 64. So her data actually is pretty good. Mm -hmm. But she draws this conclusion right from the, from the right in terms of understanding. The other thing I would say in terms of the federal policy piece, I think for all of us who are you know, active citizens and, and advocates, <coughs> is that there's always been, in the past four or five years, a majority of members of Congress who support immigration reform. And this notion that you can have this hazard rule where you have to get a majority of the majority party when the majority of the Congress itself in this democratic body, small d democratic, um, to pass legislation is outlandish. And so I think we should not be conceding to that. We should be insisting that Congress does its job, which is to vote upon the bill. And if we could push that and lift that issue up more as a, just a participatory democracy framework, the votes are there to pass immigration reform. I, I want to go back to this, this comment that you made um, about how we need to change our approach to policies. Because um, I think it applies to immigration. I think there's another conversation that's going on in the area of education. Um, and I'm going to be super controversial here. I Ooh, think okay. that affirmative action was the product of an old mindset of white progressives who asked, how can I help you people? It's hard to say because I know in progressive communities we fight real hard for, to, to bring back affirmative action. Um, I think a lot of civil rights laws are built that way. I think our immigration laws when you look at the 1965 act that finally repealed before that was the uh, Anti-Chinese Exclusion Act, mm -hmm. and it was called that. Um, and it specifically banned Chinese people because we were dirty, we could not be assimilated, we could not learn the language. 
you know, every stereotype that you can imagine now placed on name the group. Okay. Um, I th the change was now we're going to create these little categories from each country, and you each get a quota, and you each get to you get to have this number of people come in. Then we, we, we evolved to family-based. So once you're in, you can bring a certain number of family members. Um, but it still is this notion that there's a limited number of seats and somebody at the top gets to control the criteria for which you get those seats. You see, that, that's, I was getting to how those two were connected. Set-aside thinking, yeah, the set-aside yeah. project, right? Yeah. So my... My mind was blown because recently Stuart Quo, who was just on the radio today, if you were listening to um, NPR, um, they have been working across racial groups to think about higher education, not as a limited resource for which there's a set aside, for which there's a special set of rules that, that you people get to compete for, okay? which is then what creates the wedge that allows certain groups to take advantage of the Chinese American um, tiger mom who says, wait a second, why, why, why do I have to give my spot up for somebody else and now you've got this competition created, right? Um, or white Jewish mom or whatever mom, right? Instead, the question is, why aren't we putting more money into our higher education so that there's enough seats for everybody? What the hell? This, this state is rich enough. And why are we allocating so much to, you name it, prisons? Um, and if we were to expand that pie and then allocate more of the money and the seats to people who are from California based on need or, or, or want, right, we would have a very different educational system, one that values public education from K all the way up to graduate school and says, if we're going to be competitive in this world's economy, we've got to produce and invest in our young people all the way to the top. Because I remember there was a time when California was at the top. Um, so I think that that's, that's a mind shift. That's, that stops sort of saying, how do we tinker with the formula that allows you know, a, a certain segment to compete for these couple of seats, but says, let's compete for everything, but let's just broaden that pie for everyone. Um, and I think that there's, there's an interesting piece about that with immigration as well. We do, in immigration, still think about who comes in in these kind of category and quota type ways. Um, and I think that the U.S. has a kind of arrogance that assumes that people will always want to come here. Um, and I think that very soon we are going to find that the flow has gone in a different direction um, and maybe we shouldn't be so arrogant um, that now is the time to invest in those people who want to come here because oftentimes they have the most will to contribute something to this country. So I, I, think, that, I think that if we, if we reflected on this and, and had a future czar or whatever that person is that, that you know, uh, we might add to the cabinet and someday, they, they would say we should be thinking about immigration in a very different way that's not based on categories and quotas and expanding little yeah. bits and pieces. I was going to add that that takes us back to really the premise of today, which is to have that shift in mindset, to have the shift in policies, we need to have people with that mindset and, and in alignment with those policies in positions of power and being voted in, right, with, with coalitions. So, but that would require our white progressive partners to give up something, you see? They can give us a set aside the grant and the affirmative action, but it would require them to move out of the center mm -hmm. and let the peripheral people move into the center. Mm -hmm. Now that is easier said than done. It's easier to throw language and, and paternalistic and benevolent happy talk about coalitions, but actually having to trade and give something to the, those who are on the outside, it's a whole different matter. You went to Stanford, we went to, we went to good schools here. We're, we're ready to go. And still we're clamoring. How many generations later? My dad was a Rhodes Scholar, you know, on the outside, still, still scratching away in. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's. It is a, it is a question. We have the question. So the Trump's obvious, right? This is a racist, uh, old school, ridiculous, buffoonish, fool, dude. But 
I need to try, I'm turning my attention now to the people at the, at the university I'm part of, the Hollywood I look at, and my, whites, my white presumed partners, my presumed allies, and those are the people who I'm going to be critical about now. Those mm -hmm. are the people that I'm going to, 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 to question and press mm -hmm. for a different kind of relationship. By the way, kids shows, look at this. Somebody needs to do a study. So, <laughs> Ever since I had a kid, I spent a lot of time looking at little Einsteins and no, 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 octonauts. And the lead character, unless it's like Dora and it was created just to highlight the little Latina girl or Nihal Kailan. Hey, my daughter loved Dora. I love them. I love them. But they're, they're sort of like, okay, let's create that one for that demographic, right? But when you've got a little team of people, the team is always led by a little white boy. What is that about? Jake and the Pirates? I mean, I just named a bunch, but, but you know, it just, I need to stop watching kindergarten shows, but. Um, Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones. <laughs> every oh, every oh book, my. every story, every oh Hollywood my. movie. There's two new feature films about Asian Americans. They're starring Tilda Swinton and, jo and Scarlett Johansson <laughs> as Asian women. I, I was just oh, about to ask. And the argument Hollywood makes is that it's a tough sell to export Asian faces, Asian faces in the growing Asian market. That they want to see whiteness. That they bought into the dream. Well, that's and, you know, that's, it's, it's, you know, it's it's so unbelievably perverse. And the arguments now for maintaining supremacy are becoming so ridiculous and so tenuous and so such a departure from reality yeah. that take, we're going to need to. Look, I mean, what your book to me in many ways is about the study of white pathology. We talk about race, always the black people are all the most fucked up people, right? And the Mexicans are not right, 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 right behind them. <laughs> they really, they're, 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 they've got something wrong with them. Well, I think we have to look at now white pathology as far as how we organize, how we've organized race in this country. And what, is, what, are the, what are the illness within how whites imagine themselves and they imagine the world as we move forward? We don't have to be bellicose about it like Trump. But, but, we, but we have to be more critical, I think, yeah, I think about, about our presumed I'm gonna, What I'm going to do now, you guys, oh, okay. I can. Whiteness, white people, well, you lost very little scholarship. Long time, bro, bro. <laughs> True. <laughs> Kara, I need some help over here. <laughs> I know. Um, okay, so. You stopped him on his check. list of questions. It's almost a quarter after three. We're going to go to 3.30. I suspect some folks have stayed a little longer than 3.30 because this is a lot of fun and important and fascinating and a great group of panelists, obviously. But we do want to do a Q&A. And we're going to start with people in this room. And my notes from Carrie tell me that I should invite people to ask questions here first. Then we'll go to Merced. And then I uh, just want to remind everybody who raises their hand and wants to ask a question to wait till the mic comes to them so they can ask the question uh, to make sure we capture the questions on video. How did I do, Carrie? OK. So we'll start here. Uh, any questions from anybody in the audience? Right over here, over here, and then over there. So two questions on two different topics. The f is this supposed to be on? Is this okay? It's on. It should be okay. on. So anyway, uh, the first is sort of a question comment on all the states that are now passing voter restriction laws suggests to me that somebody's reading the numbers. And uh, you know maybe California isn't, and maybe the Democratic Party isn't, but somebody is. And I wondered if you could comment on that. So that's the first one. And then the second is uh, unrelated to that, but related to power. People don't give up power. And I look at the women's movement as a really prime example of the struggle there, and would suggest that whatever coalitions we create. We have to understand that we take the power. It's not going to be uh, given up. And I don't know what the, what the um, energy is for that. I mean, I don't know what the uh, path is for that. But I wouldn't expect it to, you know, for white men to stand up and say, I mean, they wouldn't do it for white women. Why would they do it for anybody else? I'll answer the, oh, no, go. Well, I'll tee you up yeah. first. So, so I do think that, uh, I mean, I talk more broadly in terms of uh, the, chapter, the last chapter is conservatives can count and that they have a dual strategy of seduction and suppression. And so the seduction is lifting out different candidates of color, the more, outside of California and Hawaii, more statewide people of color have been elected than Republicans than Democrats. 
um, and the suppression is the voter suppression efforts that you that you're that you're talking about there. So we have to kind of fight it on on, on both fronts, and we, we're not doing enough on the progressive the Democratic side, right? And Kathy and I have it made this comment in in passing, but it's worth emphasizing. We could not pass online voter registration in California with an overwhelming Democratic legislature and a Democratic governor. So that at the same time as the right is moving aggressively to take all those different types of things away. We have to kind of fight it on both levels, I feel. Yeah. Um, so on the restrictive voting policies, it is not a coincidence. It's a conspiracy. I'm not usually like a conspiracy type person, but this one is. Um, this one was a concerted, they looked at the numbers, um, and then they used different mechanisms. So some of it was a think tank. Some of it was going through an organization called the American Legislative Exchange. Council. What's the council? Council. council. ALEC. Um, they put out model bills, and then all of a sudden, in a two-year period, you saw uh, more than half of the states introducing some kind of restrictive voter legislation. Um, and it was concerted because right after Obama won, there was a wake-up call, like, oh, what? Who, who, who are you? Um, and I think actually when you look at the history of the U.S., you sort of see every time a new wave of uh, voters come in, you get pushback on sort of what the laws are and what the rules are and how we want to make sure only qualified people are allowed to vote. Um, because really in America, I think we do have, um, we have language both about voting being a right, but a mentality about voting being a privilege. Um, so, I, I, but I also think that um, as with the uh, post Prop 187 movement, as I think we will see with post Trump, um, with the restrictive voting laws, there was also an awakening in 2012 of a lot of voters who felt, wait a second, you're targeting me. I'm going to come out and vote and show you, even if I have to stand in line for four hours, I will do that to assert my right because I don't take it for granted. So sometimes, you know, as Americans, we, we need a little bit of a kick in the butt. And that was a kick in the butt. Um, I, I think that the challenge is the short versus the long term. In the long term, those kind of restrictive policies, um, if they continue, will, I think, be a wake-up call that those states that pass them will find that you can't create laws that will hold that, that wave, that tsunami back long enough. It'll happen. It just slows it down. You asked another question that was much harder, which is how do you, how do you get the power because it's not going to be given up? <laughs> well, you have to. You have to be. You have to be. You have to challenge the, the Democratic Party in this case that you might go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And of course, some of my brightest Latino thinkers and friends did did in, indeed flirt with Republicanism. Uh, Ruben Navarrete, uh, a guy named Mike Madrid, is a local political guy. Bright people who are ornery, and simply didn't want to be taken for granted by by the Democratic establishment. So they, George Bush, of course, under you know made a great got four, what 40 percent Latino votes 42 percent you know Carl Rove had a strategy he said we're going to get the Latino majority and we're going to get the Jews and we're going to let Israel run over over the place and it didn't work out so well for them but but it's but it, you know it's a cautionary tale and the Democrats should be taking heed mm -hmm. all it would take if I think Rubio was such an exceptionally talented guy he's a weasel and et cetera et cetera et cetera but the guy <laughs> I saw the guy turn around a room in D.C. on a couple of occasions, Latino liberal rooms, and he was so capable, and he had this hip-hop rap, and he had a story about his parents working in hotels, and this working-class immigrant story. He spoke Spanish. He could, you know, biggie small lyrics. You know, he had, he, had a, he, had, he had talent, and only because of Trump was he destroyed, and they ran him too hard, and they too early. But believe me, they're going to come up with somebody. Everybody's culturally competent. Everybody's hip-hop, and... And, and if, if, if this side continues to sleep, they're going to they're they're get the Latino. Yeah, well, Rubio's not done. I don't think we have an, that much of a, a durable, ideological um, memory, Latinos. I mean, you know, blacks, you, you guys have, you know, the, the civil rights thing. And the fact is, <laughs> most, most, for Latinos, just, just Cesar black. Chavez, you know, what, is a boxer from Mexico. It's simply, th these people came after the whole the, the good wave of, of, of Latinos who are here came after after 65 and 82 the, the way that crest of the wave 
They have no, they have no memory of all that, of Dolores Huerta, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I think Latinos, one of the things they have to do is refresh their iconography bank and start washing away some of that old residual labor rights storytelling. However great and noble and virtuous the project was, it's not going to resonate with the next generation of Latino voters. So you've got to, you've got to you know, this is filmmaker talking, you've got to create some new iconography hmm. to attract them. I'm going to take one so, question. Oh, I have to. You raised your hand and then we're said right here. Uh, I have to come back. I have to say I have a couple comments. But okay. so my question relates to um, mindset. How do you get people of color and progressive whites to see themselves as a voting block in a coalition with similar interests? Because we've been pitted against each other so often. How do we now come together and say, well, if we work together, we can make change? You have, a, you have to talk about it. You have to talk about issues. You have to work on the ground. You have to get people in the room with people they trust, right? Uh, community leaders, folks that have, um, that speak, that speak the community language and, and have backgrounds and, and, and um, know how to communicate with the, with the community and talk and then just start, what do you, would, what damn it do you care about? And find the common ground and not focus on, and, and, and educate, educate about that, how things are fractured, how, you know, groups are pitted against each other and talk about the common denominator and talk about, look, this is what we can have if we work together. Let me show you the numbers. Let me run them for you. Um, this, is, this, is, this is where we're at now, what we, what we could have now if we achieved, you know, certain levels of turnout. This is where we're heading. Um, what do you want? Um, it's not an easy thing. It's not, there's histories, there's locally, there's, you know, uh, issues sometimes between groups and, and, and people working again in silos or just trust issues uh, when you're trying to build coalitions. But I think it has to be on the ground. It has to be supported. It has to be real in, in terms of what people care about. And I think it's bit by bit, you know. And then, of course, just even larger leadership, you know, in terms of getting the word out there. Um, I was, oh, go ahead. Just real quick on that. I, I do yeah. think this is where Trump helps, frankly, mm -hmm. is that yeah. he clarifies, if we run against him properly, and do not let him get legitimized as is actually happening right now. People have forgotten all that anti-Mexican racist stuff. But if we draw a clear line, and are you for a white America? I think we should be having t-shirts and make America racist again. Um, but really draw that line. Then I think it's more clear to people in this election, which is a shorter term proposition. And the longer term work is this piece around which is more complicated and more difficult with, with you know. and, my, and my concern about the Hillary uh, effort here, that, that will dissipate the gains and the, the sense of a real multicultural post white coalition. And I, my concern is that this can dissipate. I don't know what's, where, where that goes. Where, where does the Obama possibility, the, the post, the, the, the multiracial rainbow possibility go now with a, with a white led, a white candidate with a very, very white party. And Vice President Cory Booker is one way. <laughs> Cory Booker, Javier Becerra, right? Um, it's not going to happen. I, so I just want to plant a, a phrase that we often say, times we'll say at Common Cause meetings, and that is, we are the leaders that we're waiting for. So I get that we're always hoping that the next person that we elect will be fantastic, but we're the leaders that we're waiting for. And so that means, you know, if somebody builds a great coalition, when it gets dissipated, that's on us. We need to invest ourselves to get involved. I think that we need to take that socially risky move, and sometimes one of us needs to run as a candidate, right? And on a personal level, some of us need to reach out to our neighbors of, of, of different racial backgrounds. I know, see, we're doing this. That didn't help. It's not modeling good behavior. Um, so I, and I think that's it, right? And, and then, you know, we're in a foundation space. So part of that is investing in organizations and leaders who build not just empowerment for their own communities, but who build coalitions and across, you know, um, race lines, but across issues. When we start to model that behavior ourselves, it becomes an unassailable truth that that is the way that it should be. When we, when we don't, then it's easy, because leadership just reflects who we are. 
So if, if we aren't doing that, then whoever gets elected is just, they're just modeling the same wedges that happen in society. That's what I would say. It, it, it's, it's much harder. It's a lot easier to believe that we could elect the right person and they'll do all the hard work for us. I think one thing we need to remember, too, in this, I mean, we're talking about the positive, where we need to go, and, but um, not everyone wants to see new voters, even within the Democratic Party, even within members of the coalition, so to speak. Um, new voters are risky, right? Um, even of the same party, they're risky, uh -huh. and they're seen as risky. Or whether it's exactly correct in any given district or area, they're just seen as risky, right? Lack of information, lack of understanding how to outreach or deal with them or talk to them or whatever. So a, a great example, I think, is, if, and whenever I mention this to people, they kind of like clicks, but the, the Democratic Party, you can very make a very strong argument, hasn't done a whole heck of a lot to mobilize the Latino community here in the state. And people think, God, that's a, a no-brainer because currently things can change. But currently, Latinos are strongly skewed in their registration and in their voting Democratic, right? It didn't used to be, by the way. It used to be just a little bit more Republican than Democrat, and that was one of the effects of, of the 90s and 187 and so forth. Um, so you would think, well, gosh, if, just if I register as many Latinos as possible by, by the sheer numbers, right, you're going to get a lot of Democrats, and wouldn't, wouldn't the Democratic Party want that? But those new voters, you don't know, right? Are they going to support the Democratic candidate in a given, support the endorsed Democratic candidate in, an, in a given election? How are they going to change the dynamics or the issues or demand certain issues being discussed that sometimes the party or the leaders in a given area, you know, don't want to be discussed? So that's actually a real pushback, and I think it's something that we should talk about because, not, unfortunately, that, that is a huge reality. And so not everybody, even in the Democratic Party, wants to see these people. For many, for many people. years, the biggest opponent to <coughs> passage of a same-day registration bill that would have allowed us to allow people to come in to vote even right up to Election Day, even if you hadn't registered, right, yeah. was the Speaker of the Assembly who was Latino and gay from Southern California, surrounded by a group of consultants who probably just created an echo chamber about, oh, you don't know who those people are. And even if they're likely to be people who might vote for, you know, a set of candidates that you support, don't do it. Um, when you look at who is chosen as the ch tapped to be the chosen one as, as candidates in districts, very often the Democratic Party chooses white men or men over women. <coughs> I don't even know what that's about. But I, I just think that what we need to ask this, which is those who are in power, perpetuate um, a lot of these uh, racial and gender inequalities. And so we need to ask it constantly and challenge it constantly. So we're going to oh. go to Merced. We, I assume we have questions from people in Merced. Is that right? Yes, I have a question. Noe Paramo here in Merced. And the question is just for your perspective. How can the elderly or repeat voter see the youth, the communities of color, the ones who are becoming the new majority, and send a message that we need to involve you, we need to work with you, so that you're the future of this country, and we need you to participate in this, this democracy. Your perspective on that. I'll take it. Um, I'll take it. Um, oh gosh, that's an echo. Gosh, that's an echo. <laughs> Um, we need to lift uh, our, our youth to yes. the yeah. narrative on well, actually, that. Just what I was get them and we could cut that off. I don't know if it's driving anybody else crazy. Okay, sorry. Um, so um, first off, uh, older older voters, our society in general, have they, there's a lot of negative attitudes in our society about young people and voting. Um, there's a lot of barriers structurally, a lot of barriers to, to why young people even think about voting or don't think about voting, civics I talked about earlier, all that sort of thing. But if you're specifically talking about older voters, one of the first things that comes to my mind is the lack of mentoring, the lack of support, and the negative attitudes that you hear often. Or at least not the, 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 the reverse. You don't see older voters or older folks, period, as much, reaching out to young people and saying, we value your vote, we value you, for, maybe we value you volunteering, we want you to volunteer, but we don't necessarily 
hear, or very little actually, of we want your vote. And there are a lot of negative attitudes. So older folks will, will say, will get nervous about a young person that they see not as qualified to vote, not as informed, not paying taxes, young people are paying taxes, um, don't have a stake in the game. I don't know if I want these people, I don't want these people voting, these young people voting for me and making decisions that affect my life, right, in my pocketbook, in my home, and so forth. Now, we know why that's, you know, that's flawed in many, re in many ways because we need a stronger democracy. Older voters need um, young people to be doing well and to be a strong tax base and to be, right, and to be um, transitioning and taking leadership and, and, and making the community better for everyone, including older folks. But I think the attitude's number one. There's, so there's a lot of education that needs to be done in, amongst older folks, older community. Um, just understanding what, why young people can and do make good decisions and how responsible they are and how they do have a stake in the game now. And then I think there's an active like mentoring and reaching out and particularly in communities of color where you can share the story, you can share the narrative, you can share the farm worker story, you can share the story of, uh, you know, of Chavez and the civil rights um, story, uh, that's everyone's story. Um, so I, I think those are two areas and there's more, but I think those are really two like critical areas. Echo in it and illustrate the mentoring piece, right? So I was, sadly, a long time ago, but at the time, the youngest person elected to office in San Francisco, I was 28 years old at the time. That was able to happen because people who had been in San Francisco for 30 years before that, African-American community leaders, right, the Zapata Guilfords, the Gloria Davises, put, said, you should run for office. I'm going to support you to run for office. I still remember Otea, who had been the uh, uh, Deputy Mayor of Feinstein, as a police officer, black police officer in the 60s, saying, all these years people have been coming to lean on me around to get the black vote out. I'm going to turn and lean on them for you now. And so he took his, his capacity, his leadership, created the space and the viability, and lifted me up to be able to actually run um, and get elected to office. So mm -hmm. I think that's illustrative of what the cross-generational piece mm -hmm. can actually accomplish. And we, and I, just a quick add, we do things in a lot of subtle ways as well. So even if you don't have an older person actively discouraging young people, again, you don't see it actively encouraging them, and you hear a lot of excuses, right? When, you so, when we don't see young people voting, or even our relatives voting, we say, you know, something to the effect of those darn kids, or oh well, or what do you expect, or they're busy with this. And so it's just being really conscious of that aspect of it, and really, um, changing the narrative around that. Yeah. Okay, so Carrie, what do you want to close with closing it down? So Merced's good with the one question? All right, great. Well, it is 3.30. Um, I don't know, I, I assume everybody had as much, enjoyed this as much as I did. Wasn't it fantastic?